Thanks as always for listening. In this episode, Chris and I discuss something that every GM has to deal with at some point or another, and that is launching a new campaign from making some preliminary decisions about the nature of the campaign and the story to actually putting the thing together to starting it off with that first session. If you want to jump right to the content, go to the two minute and 30 second mark and we'll meet you there. Hi, Jeremy. So I'll just dispense with uh, what we were just talking about. You're sick and I've been sick. Uh, I am on the mend. But I still have sound like it. (laughs) Well, no, I have this persistent. My problem is every cold I get goes to die in my sinuses and it turns into several days of congestion and unpleasantness. So that's where I am right now. And you're now coming down with something or at least it's welling up to the point of unpleasantness that you might not go to work. So. If we're not in tip top shape, blame the viruses. We didn't have a choice. My initial thought, we'd already skipped, we've already skipped two recording opportunities yep. once, one, and then once because you were ill on Monday. Yep. And I was going to, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to do tonight. And then I realized that if we don't record today, no uh, our listeners will miss a week. So, you know what? Then, then that is, uh, that, that's us. Um, that is our dedication. How's that? There we go. And so, because of that dedication, you should like and subscribe. Ah, leave a comment. Yeah. Join the conversation on our friendly Discord. How's that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely leave a comment along the lines of hope you're feeling better. Oh, right. Okay. That'd be nice. I'll take it. Uh, And I've done no gaming because I've been sick. Ah, see, I have done gaming because I I wasn't sick when I did gaming. (laughs) And tomorrow night, I'll probably still feel like crap and I'll still do gaming. No, maybe it'll help. Well, Scott was had a cold and gave it to both me and Brian. So, like, if I feel ill, I'm quite happy to just give him my cold back. It's tough. (laughs) Revenge. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, but I got you. Well, if I give it back to him and he's ill over half term, I will feel justified. That will be karma. Um, so, yes, I, play, I played the Assassin's Creed quick start, um, which was relatively quick. So it's a nice, quick, easy to play system. But I, I'd be interested to see when the final version has differences from the quick start because it's much too difficult. You know what? Send me um, send me access or send me a link to where I can get it. I'll take a look over it and we could spend an episode on it. So this is related, I think, you know, generally topically is, you know, the idea of like you, you, you do a quick start, you do something new. What we talk about today is something that is relevant to any and every GM. Yeah. Uh, and, and by extension, every player. How do you start a new campaign? And there and obviously, how do we how, how we define starting a new campaign is is uh is at issue there but let's let's talk about that briefly um i am in no position i'm not going to start a new campaign i'm actually a good way through one um but i did recently start a new campaign what are you thinking i'm i'm about i don't know about campaign i'm about to start something new okay whereas the other side like so outgunned i only intended to be a one-off right assassin's creed because that was a one-off for christmas i intended assassin's creed to be a one-off because it was just a quick start now, I'm going to play the Wrath and Glory Warhammer 40,000 role-playing oh, game. okay. And I'm not intending it to be just one. Okay. So, like, I I'm, I'm definitely know, like, I'm running. I know what I'm running for the first session. I probably know what I'm running for the second session. And then after that, there's another set of, like, four things. And I'm, I'm planning to change characters. Um, but I'll get into that as part of the thing. So, actually, yeah, so whether it's a campaign or not, I am planning to start with a bunch of new characters and a bunch of new adventures. So, so this campaign, is, campaign is beyond what I tend to do, but l- let's I'm, do I'm this, at the though. start of something. Let's, let's just, for the sake of this conversation, let's define campaign or series of adventures loosely as meaning an intention to go well beyond just a one-off or one or two sessions. Like, yeah. you, you don't know exactly how far this is going to go, but, but your intention is to go for at least several sessions and develop things I how think so. do I think... you start this how do yeah. we how do we want to define start the actual the literal launch of the campaign i.e like first session and or character creation or do we want to more expansively define the word no start? I, I, I think you have to go before that because you can't just there's there's always a before sure there is now some people call it session zeros i personally i hate I hate that phrase because for some people session zero implies something very specific and we I could do don't another... like things that get overused we could yeah that's totally true and um, I, don't like bu- I, I don't like buzzwords 
Um, at some point, maybe we can do an episode on Session Zero. Well, this, is, this isn't it. Um, but yeah, you, you need to have something before. You can't just like you and a bunch of people rock up and go, right, guys, we're starting a campaign. Because before that, either the GM has created a bunch of player, the players' characters or the players have created their characters or you know there has to have been something. There, there's, there is not a scenario really where you can just turn up, right, guys, we're playing 20... Uh, you know, we're playing 20 sessions of this thing. Yeah. Uh, we're going to you know, play to the, level 16 in like a D and D style I mean, system. For a start, if it's something that you haven't played before, someone has to read the rules. Yeah. Someone, the GM has to read the rules. Yeah. Let's be God forbid here. players read the rules. Um, uh, so yeah, you, you, you have to have a bit before the actual starting and the easiest thing to start with is either going to be, what do we want to play? Yep. Or someone saying, I want to play this which is part of the reason people end up gming because the gming or the person who wants to gm says i yeah. want to run this and everybody else goes okay cool yeah now i went before that for my most recent one but you know we'll come back to you first i think where i'm thinking is start like starting the actual first session that that's a different animal um and that that's that's downstream from where i'm thinking but i'm thinking yeah. farther along than we're deciding on x where my mind is we that is you and your group have decided you're going to play this system you're going to play which then comes you know brings with it a certain genre um and you have a general, a call it an actionable checklist of decisions already made. Not, you know, not like, well, what kind of space game do we want to yeah. play? Okay. I'm not, I'm not at that. I'm, I'm well past the navel gazing point. Like we've decided we're going to play Star Trek and we're going to play Star Trek and we're going to be, you know, a traditional Federation crew during that era. Like that's where I am. That that's been decided. Now we're at the point where. We need to talk about actionable specifics like who's going to play what and yeah. how are we going to get this thing actually going? Uh, because everyone's always excited about the first or second session, but I think you need to plan beyond that, not only as a GM, but as a group in order to, to, to really get the thing going and give it the best chance of being successful. I, I think it's this awkward thing that you need this kind of bit of space for the, to get the feedback from the players or a conversation about what we want to do and the gm to be able to go and wait okay this is what they want and this is what i can do because sure. for example you know so like we've decided playing 4k now we came to that because i basically wrote a massive spreadsheet of all of the games that i fancied playing which was like 40 long it was stupidly long it was like everything i either had and hadn't played or like infinity that i wanted to go back to um, and things, some of them were just quick starts. And I just wrote on a big list and I, I ranked everything from one to five. And I got Scott and Brian to rank, rank things from one to five. Um, you sound like you're the kind of person who's taught math. I, li I just like doing, I like doing that kind <laughs> of stuff. Because then I got to color code it and things. Oh and, my you know, goodness. I, I, well, I, it, it does it automatically. You just put it in a color scale and it'll do it by itself. But, you know, I've got to add it all together. How are your clothes this. organized in your... Cl never mind. Never, never, never. No, they're a bit of a mess, but... Okay. Um, Good. But I like, I like playing with spreadsheets. I love spreadsheets. Um, and that, that was why we did Assassin's Creed because Assassin's Creed was number one. Now, of course, classic me in between me doing that spreadsheet and then getting to the next thing after Assassin's Creed, I got interested in Warhammer 40,000, that, which was totally not you. on the list and basically said to the guys, right, well, uh, the, the Warhammer uh, Age of, was it Warhammer Age of Sigma Soulbound was on there. So I said, look, you've put that near the top. Do, we, do you fancy playing Warhammer 40,000? I finally got, I got, I got a grip of how it was. The guy was like, yeah. Um, so after we'd finished Assassin's Creed last week, I literally gave them the Warhammer 40,000 book and I gave them the, the, the Soulbound book. It said, right, look through all these books and pick the kind of characters you're interested in playing. Unhelpfully for Soulbound, they, Scott gave me a list of about 30 different archetypes across like multiple different factions and races. Oh, like, that is not helpful. probably did the right? opposite of what you would hope. Yeah, he's like, I was trying to be helpful by giving you choice. I was like, you, you yeah, but you've got there's no anyway. Brian was more helpful, so by pairing Brian's that I can that I'm going to be able to go. That's that's for the future, but that's the thing I've now I can start thinking about that. Okay, um, which then helps Warhammer... you narrow down ideas yeah. for you know decisions you have to make in, in in an existing IP, like when it comes to things like what era and what yeah. kind of yeah. angle 
Yes. Um, you know, like so taking the- Star Trek Adventures as an example, you, you have different eras, obviously. If you're going to play a default Federation style game, um, you also have the difference between, you know, the type of starship, the mission profile, the overall type of adventure. Is are you are you going to take the odd route and and place the characters on a space station? And that's going to vary in what they're going to do by era. Yeah. as well so yeah those, those kinds of things you you need those limiters as a gm or you present those limiters hey i've got this idea to work within this ip and this is the yeah this is the cool angle so you either suss that out of your players or you present that to them if you have the idea i think definitely to, that's the yeah that's the two way at some point you need some kind of you can, you can just turn like i've already decided all this right now make your characters in this really narrow thing you know, if they or buy they into it, the other way, right? I, I want, I want your ideas of where we're going to go. I'm going to go away and noodle about it a bit, and then maybe I'll make the characters that are going to fit into that. Now, that's that's what I've done in this case. I, yeah. they they gave me suggestions for the kind of character they like to play. I've then gone and looked at the resources I've got to, because I think Soulbound, I may well end up just playing my own adventures. I'll use the B series I've got and the the books I've got, yeah. and I'll do my own stuff. I won't use a pre written adventure because the characters they're interested in playing don't fit into the pre-written adventures. Now, for Wrath and Glory, it's very much that they have, you have these tiers of play. You get like tier one, two, three, four. And tier one are like just like your basic bog standard soldier or like scum ganger. And tier four are like the ridiculous like Inquisitor and Space Marines. So is so, this measured in like the size of their, their shoulder pauldron? Yeah, it's not far okay. off that, yeah. I figured um, and so I was actually, here's what we'll do, because they they picked a variety. So I said, look, we'll, we'll leave the tier three and four stuff for later down the line. We understand the system and we've got, I've got more books. Um, here's what, I, and, and, then, and, I, there's, and that's the thing I've then had, I've looked at what they've suggested and I've come up with what I'm going to run next. So my initial ideas, and, but, and then I've made, I've started making the characters. I'm going to start off, we're going to play a few sessions. I've got pre-written adventures, so we can learn the rules. Essentially, so we can re- learn the rules with some basic characters that I made, which aren't complicated. Get a hang of the rules. If they die, it doesn't matter. And then my intention is sort of three, sort of on the third session, we'll move up to the next set of characters. We'll be tier two, so they'll be more powerful, but they'll also be more complicated. Um, and then there's a set of adventures I can use for them. So th- is this is approaching a game that none of you have played. And so this is yes. smart. And for our clever listeners, recognize in this, a, a, I think, a gem of wisdom. If you're going to run a game you haven't run before, whether your players have played it before or not, but I think more than likely, I mean, let's face it, the way it works out, usually if, if you haven't played it and you're the forever GM, they haven't played it either. You're the catalyst for them playing new games. And you have to program into your, your scaffolded, your sequence of how are we going to start the first session and what kind of adventure and where are we going to go next and next and next? You have to account for the fact that you're going to be learning the rules. They are going to be learning the rules and that you will approach the game and the story differently than you would if you were proficient. Yeah. Uh, that's really smart. I, I had not thought of that in those direct terms, but yeah. Well, I think then it makes a difference on what you're going to play because if you're playing something like it's like I haven't played before, I've read the rules, but I'm not really by playing a thing that says this isn't this can be used as an intro literally says this can be used as an introductory adventure for sure. characters of the tier, this and this. Well, that's great because it's already designed to be like to one of that. the initial yeah, ones. To, to, I mean, actually, this one's the one I've picked is great. It almost assumes that the characters like have kind of only got a fuzzy idea of sort of where they are and what they're doing. So you, they can learn about the setting as they start. Gotcha. Because I think that's always what, one of the awkward things, particularly if you're going to an IP that your players aren't used to. How do you deal with the fact that, and you can come in the other way, how do you deal with player knowledge versus character knowledge? Right. Because in some settings, there's the, you know, the characters should have knowledge and the players have like no knowledge. Right. And then you have things like in Star Trek and maybe Star Wars where it's the opposite. Depending on the where person. The, yeah, where the player knowledge is insane and the character knowledge is, you know, reasonable. Yeah. So then, that's, a good, that's a really good point. Um, and so you, you need to take that into account. The worst thing you can do, especially, and we all do this as GMs, you get excited about an IP. You get excited about a campaign, especially though w- with an IP where there's rich canon, whether it's, you know, wherever it's from. And your players don't know it very well. 
and you buy it, like let's say even you didn't know about it, but you're like, oh, I'm finally going to give it to the shoulder baldrons. And so you buy the book and you're like, oh, this is so great. And you're just like, nom, 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 nom. And you gobble it up like cereal. And then you're like, come on, players, be excited. And they're just staring at you like, I don't, I don't really know like what this is like. And you can't, you cannot do the thing that so many of us would be inclined to do. Like, here, read this. Yeah. Come back now. You can't give your players homework. You have to yeah. get them excited about it and into it if they're not already. And then you can dole out things over time. But, yeah. but I think the key in this moment right now is when it comes to the rules and when it comes to the, the, the backdrop, you have to take into account a, a slow ramp up if the rules and that backdrop are new to the players, especially. But give yourself credit and a little bit of grace as well to not yeah, and don't get too excited and like fire hose puke a setting on them i think this is why sci-fi is much harder than fantasy well that's not true it's much harder than sort of medieval fantasy because of lord of the rings yeah. and but even before Lord mm. of the Rings, you know just the kind of there's the standard idea is because it is because of yeah, Rings. like before we not, the lo- there's like you can just say it's like that and before we had the Lord okay. of the Rings, people have an idea of what things look like in history. So right. we know what a knight looks like. We know what a bandit looks like. We know what a horse looks like. It just like, looks like the know. English countryside. Exactly. And if it's another country, you know, so if we're further ahead, right, we know what the Renaissance, because we've got the musketeers. Yeah. And then we've got, you know, Da Vinci. And we have these history. We can go further back. We've got the Greeks. We have this historical touchstones. We have an idea what fantasy looks like. Mm-hmm. So it, look, oh, well, it's, it's that, but there's a dragon. Yeah. Or like the orcs, you know, the orcs are just easy. inserts for other things. So it's easy. The trouble with sci-fi is that it's fine when it's sci-fi that people have seen. Oh, it's right. like Blade Runner. Okay, it's, it's, it's like Star Wars. It's like Star Trek. The minute it's something different, and this right. is why I've never run Warhammer 40,000, because I, same problem like we've got with Mutant Chronicles. I have right. felt that I don't really understand. I, I can read, I've read the law. Right, I understand the history. What does it look like? I, I understand the characters. Yeah, I, I get the factions. I get the interplay. What you just said, uh, what does it look like? You know, as an average dude, do he, get, he gets up. I mean, do, do they have beds? Does he have a shower? You know, just a simple. Does he go and buy, a sh- like, milk from a convenience right. does he, store? Does he sit in a park and read a book? Yeah, does it's just all that, that. And it's irrelevant. Your players are never going to do that. But that kind of stuff gives you an idea of what the world is like. I mean, I still don't have some of those answers for so, 140,000. But I have enough of an idea through a computer game I've played that I have a feel for what it looks like, at least. Okay. Well, that's helpful. So, yes. so, so we, we have one thing nailed down, okay, in terms of accepting the fact that communicating system and setting is going to come slowly over time and that you should be deliberate about how you dole things out. Like, I, I think yeah. that... And it'll be interesting to see what Modiphius does with the Octane Cthulhu um, starter box whenever that comes out. But, you know, the, the original Star Trek, the adventure, Star Trek Adventures um, beginner's box, the mini campaign, which is made up of three adventures of a couple of scenes each, they were very smart about mechanically what kinds of things they included in those scenes in a sequential manner. So they, they, they help a, G, a new GM understand and apply the rules while doing the exact same thing with the players uh they help them do that from a zero to hero kind of standpoint like they don't touch star starship combat until the second adventure entirely until you've yeah. got the core mechanic down they don't even touch combat until after you've done some basic roles so i would approach your first adventure you know, look at, okay, how can I make sure that we are, as a group, proficient in using the core mechanic? Now, obviously, this is all moot if everyone knows the rules. If you're just playing another, you know, you're using the same system, but you're just playing in a different, um, a different scene, setting, whatever you want to call it, then this, that's, all, that's all moot. Well, then um, often, but, I, but even then in something like, let's say you're playing 5e for the 10th time, there's always the chance then that it's a character difference. Someone's going to mm-hmm. be playing... A, a new character right. class they've never played or even in 2d20 i mean there's People so many variants too but you might be using a house role you've not played before yeah. someone is probably playing a character with rules that they haven't yeah maybe they've never used a magic user they marry suddenly now they're going to be able to do something now they they've got a bunch of talents you know it's unlikely if you start a new campaign the chance that all the players are playing 
things where the rules are exactly the same as what they played last time. So someone's always going to be playing with something new. Yeah. Even if you understand, even if it's the core mechanic, it could be other stuff could be massively different. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, it just, it, all it takes, especially in a, in a system like that is someone to say, can I use this book too? Can I use stuff from Xanathar's or whatever? Well, that, okay. that's, that's a good thing actually to get into is the, is, is the, how do you decide who, who makes the characters and how do you do it? Because that okay. is an important like, Let's tackle body. that next. Because yeah. that's, that's, I think that is, regardless of whether people are new to the system or not, you need to put some consideration into that. Yeah. I mean, personally, I've kind of got to the point now where I hate having a session making characters. It is the slowest, most painful. It, it feels like a waste of time. Oh, see, you're I'm sitting the opposite, but I, give, sit, I, I approach it. So, you know, uh, what I found is that, you know, I see my mates once a week. So gaming time is you know, it's, it's valuable. Spending a, spending a session just making characters isn't ideal. Now, there are exceptions to that. Mm-hmm. Something like Infinity, where it's got a life path um, or something. I remember they all fake things we had to, where you actually, yeah. you need to make a character in conjunction with other people so you can make the links between the characters. That's one thing. But for most games, having to sit there and you know you, especially if you've got one copy of the book you've got the book yeah, yeah. You, it's just such a slow process and you have yeah. to explain the things you do it and you're passing the book around and you know, that's me that's me with two players yeah you know i've had things where we've spent three hours so, making two characters okay so how, is- how do you handle this because you are averse to a a character building session or a session in which characters are being built whether it's the whole session or not you're averse to that what's your solution yeah, so what I've kind of taken to doing recently is basically like, you know, throwing them the books while we're doing something else and kind of just saying, right, what kind of character are you interested in playing? And that's what, I, well, that's what I've done for 40K. Well, who, what do you fancy playing? They picked some things. I've gone away. I'm, gonna, I'm making up the characters that are, you know, the, the, mostly the stats. Now, when we start, before we start on tomorrow night, the first 10, 20 minutes, I'll give them the book back and go, right, you need to come up with your characters, you know, person that. Here's, here's a rough backstory for your characters based on stuff I've picked. You know, they can change it if they don't like it. But you need to come up with some personality traits and, and the character's name. So they've got some ownership of the character. They've come up with the initial archetype. They know what their character wants to be like, roughly. I'm going to do the mechanical side of it. They're going to finish off. So that the, what the person is like, that's theirs. Sure. But the mechanics of it, which is the thing that takes the time, I'm going to do that because so I, I, you know, I managed to cram it in during the week this week. But you're doing that based on your knowledge of your players and also their direct suggestions yeah. or ideas from the. So you're not just making. It's not just like a like a con where people are showing up and you're handing them pregens no. and you're saying you can make up the name. You're giving them a. You're giving them a, a almost completed character minus those other pieces that itself was informed by your knowledge yeah. of them. And they're, okay, okay, all right. And, when we, and when we did D&D, I basically, well, when we did D&D, it's different. Brian will quite happily make his own characters. I make okay. Scott's characters for him. We do, we do not let Scott make characters. Well, th- you know what? Because it, th- it would take, Bri- Brian, he'll do it. Scott would just take too long and I he would think... get lost in the book somewhere. And it's like, right, it's, Scott, what, what do you want to play? I want to play this, right? I'll, I'll make them. Because again, the kind of the important thing is like, right, I want my character to be able to do like sort of this and this. This, this is my vision for the character. You know, we did D&D, we picked the art. We, picked, we, we found the art we liked and we started with the art. That's what I want my character to look like. Right, that's what he look. What that's what they look like. What class will match that? What things will match that? Come up with a backstory, um, and then I'll do the mechanics, because the mechanics isn't maybe necessary. You know, the mechanics is the is how you play the game, but what the character acts like and what yeah. they're going to be like that yeah, might. Depend you know what? On. Again, that that goes back to this this issue of you know your players. You know. Yeah. We're not talking about, you know, you're not going to run a, a, by our definition of campaign for the sake of this episode, you're not going to run this for a bunch of strangers. No. You're going to run this for people you know. Um, okay. So what I, do you do then? Because you okay. clearly do a character building session. Well, it depends. Um, no, okay. It depends. However, my preference now um, is to give the... Give the players, you ask them, say, say, like, once we, we as a group have decided this is, you know, we're going to run Star Trek Adventures on a ship 
doing primarily exploration missions during this era. Like we've nailed down those big picture limiters. Um, I have invited the, the, my players to share, like we'll share online on our, we have a, a Discord for our group and we'll knock around ideas. Like, I think I'd like to play this kind of character. I think I'd like to play that kind of character. Um, and this is based on their knowledge of the, the rules. Um, and then what I do is, is kind of guide, facilitate, proctor, whatever you want to call it, a, a conversation over a period of, you know, like a week or two or so, where we will nail down the, the role, whether that's a formal thing in the, in the rules or not, a role for each of the characters, for each of the players. And then because they have the rules themselves, I'll have them make their characters themselves. But they're not um, doing it at the table. Then they're doing that. Away they're from they're the typically table yeah. They're they're typically doing this on their own um, because they have the rules themselves. So they make their own characters, and then they will share them. Will share them electronically with one another. I can take a look over them. They yeah. can take a look at and know. Like for for example, a couple of months ago when we were preparing to start Kingmaker with Castles and Crusades. Castles and Crusades was a game that that no one yeah. had had played before. Yeah, uh, we did a couple of short demo sessions so that people could understand how the rules were different. Because you know, coming from Five E, there were a lot of things that seemed deceptively the same, but they are not. And mm -hmm. and and especially how different um, class abilities play out in the game. Things were very different than you would if you looked at the character classes. You would expect. If you looked at them from a 5e perspective, oh, I know what these characters are going to be able to do. And things don't work out that way. It's just a different game. Yeah. So we, did, we took the same approach, and I had them make their characters. And then we came in, and we tested out those characters. We, like, we demoed the characters they had made in these throwaway sessions. And then we, we, they refined them and refined them. And then we said, okay, let's go ahead and, and, um, and start playing. And that actually helped us start to adapt to the rules and get used to the rules and become you know at a, at a good enough level proficient with them so that we could play that's something that i recommend also is that yeah you definitely have to take into consideration what we had said before like how you map out your early sessions to not try to like do all the rules at once but it's perfectly fine to run throwaway sessions yeah you know, or run a session, say, listen, we're just going to do two or three combat encounters and you're going to start at like, you know, max hit points or health or whatever it is given the system. And to not, I mean, I, I know that, and it was weird because I, I went through this a little bit, your, your comment about like, hey, my gaming time with my friends is at a premium. I don't want to piddle it away doing stuff that I don't get a lot of fun out of. And when I realized that playing some encounters and freeing the players to just be like oh my character got injured or killed doesn't matter we're just going to start fresh yeah. because we're just testing these things out um we had a lot of fun with those you know a couple yeah. of years ago when we when we uh uh wanted to play uh star trek adventures we ran a whole session as a holodeck uh starship <laughs> combat exercise and it was just so that we as a group could, could get our head around the system. And it was just as fun as playing a, a regular, in fact, a regular session. So uh, I think that's a good way to, to go about it as well. But yeah, I've had, I typically have them make the characters out of and then bring them and then we all compare. Um, now, soon I'm going to actually, for the next two sessions, I'm going to be running Aris because one of my players has, her sister's going to be in town and they want to introduce her to the 2D20 system and they like Aris and so on and so forth. So we're going to, we're putting aside Kingmaker for a little while longer to run these two sessions. What I'm going to, what I'm asking them to do is show up with a concept and we're going to quickly make characters. Yeah, because you can. Um, and I'm going to oversee that. We're going to do that in session and we're going to, we're going to get going pretty quickly. I found that, um, you know, if you, if, if players have a clear idea and they're committed, you can get through character creation pretty quickly. Yeah. I think with certain system. systems, you got, and I mean, actually the, as it turns out with the, with the wrath and glory, if you use the archetype character builders, um, you basically have picked the character like they pick because they pick their archetypes. All I really did was take the stuff it tells you in these archetypes, filled in the character sheet, and then had a few XP left 
which I used to buy. Oh, and that was it. The points were gone. Like Brian's, I think it was Brian's character. I had literally one choice what to do with the points were left. That was it. That character. So I did nothing. I didn't, I didn't, I, I wrote it on the character sheet, but I didn't make any choices at all. He'd already picked, I want this kind of character. Um, Scott's had marginally more. But I think, like you said, the good thing is essentially we're going to have almost two tester things. Yeah. If after two sessions they love those first two characters, basically their stats are terrible. So I think they just fail everything. So I'm not sure they will. Um, but after the first two sessions, if they go like, look, we really want to keep these two characters, then we'll probably, I, I can just carry on with them. Um, but I suspect we're like, well, look, let's, let's move on to these other two. Or yeah. it might be they go, screw it, let's play two characters each because we've done that a bunch of times. Well, okay. So we, we have some, we have this first step of this, you know, narrowing down and, and, and placing, you know, choosing system, choosing setting, obviously narrowing down and placing some limiters in there. So character creation becomes possible. Um, yeah. that's relevant to what you're going to do and GM planning is possible. Um, got a couple of different approaches, approaches that I think, depending on whether you know the system or not, or they know the system or not, and how your affinities within your group or not, we got character creation. So now characters are done. Yeah, we've, we've taken these first two major steps. What what for you comes next? Before that, that very that inaugurating session where you you know, you hold the starter gun in the air and boom, and you're playing. I mean, essentially, as the GM, it's the, the what, what am I doing? And this go we've done our, we've done episodes on this already, in terms of what we do in, you know, the difference in adventures, and campaigns and a series of adventures and, and the difference between pre maids and campaigns. And so, but that that is up to the GM. Well, it's up to the GM to some extent, because if it's like, well, we've only got four weeks, but then something's happening and well, we, someone else, you know, we've only got a limited amount of time, then that would change things, obviously. But like, you do have to have that thought. Is this an, is this an open-ended campaign which is going to run until everyone's sick of it? You know, that, the classic, the one that I hear about and I've never, oh, I've done as a kid, that we're going to start at level one and we're just going to play. Right. See where it takes us. And it, you know, it's in a world and we'll just yeah, you know, the, build the, from that there. kind of campaign. We we play as you see. Or is it more of a defined, you know, like a Star Trek season approach where yeah. there's an overall bad guy and we're gonna bunch of sessions, but there's something happening in the background and we're maybe gonna play for ten sessions. You know, that's the kind of thing, you know, I've done cut like something like playing like Castle, uh, Revenge of Strahd, whatever the hell it's called. Like, why can I never Curse remember the name of it? But that was very much right. We're gonna play this until we get to the end of it. Well, I mean, that's handy if you if you if you are taken with if you see a published adventure or campaign, you go, wow, that looks really cool. Yeah. Then whether you finish the thing or not, the easy thing is already there that you could just play it through to its yeah. uh, to its completion. I think that's important to have some sense of. I think that people can make um, unrealistic commitments out of, uh, you know, too much optimism. I remember like, I don't know, not long after 5e came out, I, uh, the group that I was, was GMing, uh, they really wanted to play into like high levels. And I have never been a fan of GMing high levels. I've never got that high. And, well, yeah, you just, things happen. And I remember being very excited. I was like, I, I'm, I'm going to commit. We're going to make it to at least 15th or 16th level. And I, and I just remember looking back like a few months later, like how unrealistic and silly of a, of a promise that was. And I fooled myself. But, um, but yeah, I think some sense, especially for the GM, if you want to build a story, especially if you're writing the story yourself, if you want to build a story that has foreshadowing, that yeah. has uh, recurring NPCs, that you know, if you not that you're going to sketch out the whole plot, which then turns into you're forcing your players to play characters in your book, that's a whole nother issue. But you have to have some idea as to how far is this going to go. I'm going to take this baddie and put him in my back pocket for a while, and he's going to come back later, and you know, like he's going to you know steal your sister, kidnap your sister, or something like that, and that'd be cool. You have to have a sense of eh, generally how long is this going to go for. I think that's a that's sitting in the background. I think you definitely <clears throat> how far you think you might want to ride yeah. this thing once you've got the characters, and before you actually start, you need to have the idea right. What, what am I doing? Am I yeah. going to, yeah, that, because because the easy thing is to do kind of arcs. Okay, I don't actually know if we're going to run this forever or not, but if I go in a, you know, pick a time period, you know, not a time period, like a time period in terms of sessions, right? Yeah. I think, 
you know, I'm going to pick a good number. I'm going to go with between sort of five and 10 sessions. I'm going to aim to finish the first arc in that, right? So I'm going to introduce this threat. Yeah. I'm going to introduce these NPCs. I'll aim to have kind of the big confrontation with a big bad, you yeah. know, thinking sort of TV series terms at the end of that period. And then we can move on from there. Yeah. Okay. Because I think, to be honest, if we plan further ahead than that, I mean, that's why I quite like, you know, the D and D books, the quite, I I ran Stroud in less than 10 sessions that you can probably, you can make them take longer, but you're talking yeah. between 10 and 15. So that's a good chunk of time. You know, you're it talking is. three or four months to get that. Yeah. That's a real, you know, go thinking beyond three months with in a role playing realistically. Yeah. Well, there's, there's another, there's another angle. Failure. You can see this from another angle. Also, you can look at what's going on in the real world. Mm. You know, for example, we know that, in most cases, I've heard this from tons of people, like you get up, you know, you get to late November to like early January, and because of Thanksgiving through Christmas, holidays, if you've got kids, school semester ending, things like that, relatives coming, you know that like your schedule for gaming gets all wanged up Yeah, when people go on vacations and things like that happen. So you say to yourself in August, okay, I'd like to be done I have until like mid to late November when my when everyone's schedule is going to get dicey and a really great campaign is going to get derailed potentially. Yeah. So how what do I want to reach by then? You've also got yeah. that issue. I think yeah, I think this issue of scope and timing is um is really important. You need to, to have in the back of your mind, even if I you're mean, using a published adventure. That's where we messed up last year playing D and D. Because at the start of the year, you said, "Right, we're well, going to play D and D." D in the first place is what you do. Um, anyway. No. We. <laughs> wow! Wow! That's such an easy dig. It was. Uh, it was. It was cheap. We, we said, "We, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons film is out. We're going to play D and D for the whole year." Okay, but where we're wrong is the, the kind of actually, if we'd sat down and thought about, it, we should have realized we never do anything over the summer. Yeah. Over the summer, because. You know, there yeah, are three stuff, of them. stuff happens. School holidays are six weeks. Yeah. We are all away at different times. Okay. You know, if we could, if we all coordinated and made sure we were all away for the same two week period, yeah. we'd have the other four weeks. But the reality is, is because we've all got kids, we all take holidays during that time. Yep. And invariably what happens, we do not see each other for six weeks. And therefore things we should have said, we're going to play D and D up till it. And I remember getting, I was like I said this year, it was sort of June time and realizing we're not going to get all this stuff finished. Yeah. So I said, right, well, I'm just, I am going to finish my storyline. So it's two so things. To... It, it, it's two things then. And this can actually, this needs to be taking place in the mind of the GM. And, and to bring this up as a, where relevant, as a conversation topic with players, this can go on while steps one and two are happening. As you, as you formalize and think more about what the campaign loosely used is going to be, how far do you want to get story-wise? How does that express in the real world? And where will the real world intrude into and how do you adjust the story uh, pacing and the number of sessions based on that? Okay, really quickly awesome. then, <laughs> I saw that. So really quickly, we, we, we have these, these two steps that go in sequence and one that kind of weaves over them or sits over them. Your characters are made, you've got a story, you have a, a general scope, you know where you're gonna start, how do you actually start the first session? Because I have an uh, idea. Uh, a lovely idea, actually. I mean, the I mean, in the case of it, because I'm using a pre-written adventure, I'm just going to go. I'm just going straight into the, the first adventure. So, go on now. What's your idea? Okay, thinking bigger they, and better. Do they, do they meet at a can? In a, no, 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 in no, no, a no, no, no. I, I'm actually, actually, this is this has nothing to do directly with the story or the characters itself. Okay. All right. This is actually nothing to do with that. What it has to do with, I think, is setting the stage and the energy for you as a group to do the story and have the fun and do it well. And this is something that I have now done twice. Uh, and it worked really well both times. And I even had one of my players after this last time say, the next time we start a new campaign, let's do this. I was like, okay, cool. Uh, let's do this again, that is. Mm. And, uh, and so I absolutely most certainly will. And that is to make the first session a special event. 
for you as a group. Have a potluck. <laughs> if you play in the evening, have dinner together. Like, ha and I don't mean like crap do food, like friggin' Mountain Dew and pizza. Make, be a grown up, make good food, and, 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 and have a meal together. And, and honestly, like, here's what, here's what I did. Uh, years and years ago, I decided we're going to have, the first time I did this, I took care of it all, and I made bread bowl beef stew in bread bowls. And then I found this some kind of 16th century British recipe for a, uh, <laughs> here it comes, uh, for a, a cheddar cheese and apple pie, which was actually, I mean, it was like, I wanted to run laps for about a month after eating it. I mean, it was, it was like, this is so rich. It's really good. Um, I'll just have one small piece anyway. <laughs> uh, and, and so what I did is I chose the food to make it kind of feel like the adventurer tavern kind of thing. So we, the players kind of met in a tavern to play our game. Now this last one, I, I pulled some stuff out of the, uh, the D and D cookbook. Uh, the best thing about D and D nowadays is the cookbook. Uh, I made the uh, wood elf salad, which is abs. The wood elf garden salad is glorious. It is so good. I made that. Um, I made a stew. I made my. I took their their stew recipe, and I took some other stew recipes, and I bastardized it and made something funky monkey, and it, that turned out really well. And then I invited everyone else to bring other stuff. So a friend of mine, Joe, made really excellent. Um, what are those damn things called? Um, creme brulee. Wow. A little like burnt sugar on yeah. top, and he had a little torch that he brought and Jeez. burnt them. Um, another guy, uh, Drew brought, uh, he made like, uh, he got these little, they look like little burlap sacks, like little adventurer, you know, sacks of treasure and filled them with like a really awesome trail mix so that we could have munchies while we were eating. And then, um, Jody and Chuck, the, the, the couple that's in my group, they brought this excellent, um, like mold cider in a crock pot. All right. So we had our adventurer's feast. We met in a tavern to have our, to start our, our adventure. And it was just a lot of fun because it reminded us that like, hey, we're friends and we're having like, we, we can do this together and have this time together and then do this fun thing. And so we met a little bit, we met about an hour earlier and we did all that. Um, and we're definitely going to do that. I actually gave Joe a hard time. I was like, is that because you want to just like, you already want to weigh off this campaign? You know, like, well, let's do this again in a month. Like, no, but we will absolutely do that. When, when in some point in the future, uh, when we start a new campaign, I will, uh, I will oversee putting together a potluck meal that is at least, at least points to the story we're going to do. So if it's Star Trek, we might have like weird spray painted space food. I don't, oh I don't my know. God. But oh yeah. Um, but we'll do that. We'll do that. Um, so I think that's a, that, that's a, it was just really cool. It was, it was a lot of fun and it, it reminded us of the many, one of the many reasons that we, we come together for these games and then the feast pointed at the game. So, and then we played. And now they, they, they like castles and crusades enough <laughs> or they like it. So uh, it's been successful. So that's what I think we should do. Or you should do. There's and no you, way I'm Chris, doing that. And you meaning those listening. Yeah, I'm not going to. If I cook for those, it's I get pizzas and I no, cook. No, man, it's so much fun. Like, it's like when you, when you are inspired to make time. your own adventure. There's like no way on a Friday night having worked. You know, you do this on a Saturday. Yep. We meet on a Friday night. Yep. I have worked a full week. So we get takeout. We get Proper takeout. Proper planning prevents poor performance. We worked a full week and we don't want to cook. If I cook, it's because we're going to save money and I, I get, I pre, get pre-made pizza. Don't you have a crock pot? Yeah, we're not cooking anything like that. Mika does cook it like that. I cook well, then you stuff. just grovel. No, I'm not making Mika cook stuff like that. No, you as it is, I moan, at, I moan at the other two anyway. Wow. So... Uh, so yeah, that is, that is never happening. They get enough food from us already. They want to invite us to their houses for food. Well, for those of you listening, uh, it sounds like a very nice idea. It was a lot of fun. Here. It was a yeah, lot of fun. Good. And it, yeah, it took, it took a little extra effort. It took a little extra planning, 
but um but it was it was exciting and the food was really good and sitting around and just talking and reminding ourselves that we like hanging out with one another for for multiple reasons uh was uh, was good and i think that it lent it 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 opened the door and and opened up like a smooth on ramp to the game itself and then of course for like because these bags of snacks that drew made were were quite large um we had like adventurer uh iron rations for a couple of weeks yeah i think that sounds that sounds really good fun all right that's how you start um, a new campaign well that's how you start a new campaign that's how you do it and then now that you've listened you're supposed to like comment and subscribe and join the discord boom there we go Thank you, as always, for listening to Fluff and Crunch. You can join our Discord, you can subscribe to the podcast, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, all through the links in the show notes. Thanks again, have a great day, we look forward to talking with you.